all right chat what are we covering tonight so we started on a topic on saturday about elephant biology and on saturday we were talking about elephants and their utilization of cancer tonight we're going on a little bit of a different route tonight we're going to be talking about elephant perception of well just a vast variety of things um for example the big one is going to be odorants to begin with so we're going to talk a little bit about how animals in particular mammals humans smell like how odorants work and why the elephant actually has a really really amazing set of nose like amazing nose and why they're just so powerful what is the name of this journal yes it is pnas nmd it sounds like something else but it's not something else it's in fact it's just a weird letter combination nmd it means proceedings of the national academy of sciences did they think about that? Did they think about that when they named it? Did they not? They did not. But NMD, what I was excited about and what we're trying to do with this, um, no, actually NMD, this journal is genome research. This one's genome research. The other one, this journal, let's see, this journal here was about general elephant perception is PNAS, but the one that we're going to be talking about is in genome research so what's cool about these studies is that there's very few genetic studies on how to actually learn about elephants and their molecular biology and that's a little bit of what we're going to be looking at tonight and so what this was was a look at why elephants have a good smell perception and it turns out it's because there's these olfactory receptors, which we talked about in insects, and there's a genetic expansion of them, meaning that there are duplications of the receptors. And when they duplicate, they duplicated a lot. And during duplication, there was some mutation. And that mutation led to what? New receptors. And so that's how they got this giant expansion of smell. Yes, hi, Jimmy. Jimmy, you won the raffle, sir. You won the raffle. I apologize if there was a delay in you winning the raffle, Jimmy. Jimmy, you get options, my friend. There is either the Cyan's 3D logo. There is the sousaphone. There is the guitar. There is the drums. There is the green hollow. There is the purple. There is the gold if you spin the cookie wheel. There is the red. There is the magnet and another magnet. You really didn't, Jimmy? Jimmy, you or Music Girl win almost every stream. One of the two of you. Hi, Peekaboo. Welcome in, Peekaboo. Mr. B, which one would you like, Mr. B? I'm hoping to get out to the post tomorrow. So I'm hoping to get these sent off. And we'll have to grab Risto. Cookie Wheel? My God. All right, Jimmy. Jimmy's doing the cookie wheel chat. All right. Cookie wheel. Here we go. In three, in two, in one. Oh, so close, Jimmy. So close to the, gr the gold, but you do get a red hollow sticker. Spectre. Uh, congratulations, Jimmy, <clears throat> on the hollow, the red hollow sticker. I'm so sorry. It was very close to the gold. I know, Jimmy. I know. But it was it was right on. I, Jimmy, I don't control the cookie wheel. Cookie wheel controls me. Cookie. Red is still poggers. Well, Jimmy, you are poggers, sir. Uh, Jimmy, if you want to know, if you want to know about the poggers... If you want to know about the poggers, Mr. Jimmy B, I can tell you about poggers. That's this sticker right here. I actually got two of these stickers. That's a pogger sticker. That's a pogger sticker. Jimmy, thank you again for it. And I'll get that sent out to you tomorrow, my friend. Grimly, you're breathtaking. How are you doing today, Grimly? All right, chat. So we're back to... There's a genetic expansion of olfactory receptors inside the elephant. 
and they were doing genetic sequencing to identify how that works. So we have to go back in some fundamental biology about not just how the elephant smells, but how do humans smell and other mammals as well. Try getting another cookie wheel, probably won't try to eat it again. Maybe Blaze, listen, it does look tasty, but honestly, I think it's probably a hard cookie. I think that it's probably dried out at this point and it's probably for the best to to just not not try to eat it, you know? Possibly potentially. So, we will begin again with how humans smell. We're going to work our way backwards in evolutionary time. Also, guys, go check out the amazing and legendary Jimmy B93. Breathtaking soul. I love your face, Jimmy. I love your face, Jimmy B. All right. This is just going to be reviewing how humans smell. Not stink-wise, but through odorant receptors. How do what are the odorant receptors human ha human have? And how does that work? And we'll link it back to other It's a good general rule of thumb for mammalian systems. It's the first sense you use when you're born. One out of every 50 of your genes is dedicated to it. It must be important, right? Okay, take a deep breath through your nose. It's your sense of smell, and it's breathtakingly powerful. As an adult, you can distinguish about 10,000 different smells. Here's how your nose does it. Smell starts when you sniff molecules from the air into your nostrils. 95% of your nasal cavity is used just to filter that air before it hits your lungs. How do you determine what sense to use first? I think NMD, because when you're born, you don't have your eyes open. Uh, breathing is not a sense specter. Breathing is not a sense. Touch is a sense. Sight is a sense. Auditory cues is a sense. Smell is a sense. Um, those are senses. Breathing is not a sense. Breathing is a action. Taste is, yes, another one. Presumably you don't taste when you pop out either right away. Um, and how you determine NMD, I think that's a little bit of a... More of an inflammatory statement for the video. I don't know, I like from a scientific perspective, I don't know how you would actually identify that as being the first sense, because one could also argue there could be auditory cues. Um, although I think the suggestion is that there are, um, like your ears are clogged to begin with, but and, and maybe like touch response isn't as fast. There's a lot of like human studies that I just am not familiar with NMD. I haven't, I don't know if they've taken one, like a deep enough, close enough to look and see how that works at this stage. But something definitely to think about. Uh, tongue is an active sense due to tongue flavor of air. I don't know what that means, Spectre Flight. I don't know what that means. But at the very back of your nose is a region called the olfactory epithelium. Neuralicia! How are you doing today? Guys, if you're not checking out Neuralicia, legendary neuroscientist extraordinaire go check out the breathtaking neuralicia neuralicia tonight we're continuing our foray into elephant biology and we're starting off with this particular paper talking about how the olfactory repertoire so the ability to smell and have diff there's like different smell receptors in the elephant those that genetic pool or like that like the region of the genome has expanded through genetic duplication and then following mutation this means that with that expansion there's additional odors that they can smell so first we're just talking about how mammals in particular humans are able to smell and process smell signaling before we jump into a more particular look at how elephants do it and then we'll be talking about a couple of other um elephant biology tidbits including um learning and memory on how that front works um, also elephant culture, which is quite remarkable in terms of complexity and a couple of other facets as well. This again was a redemption from Grimly. He redeemed a new Psycom character, which was an elephant. Um, and so then we're finally getting to just talking about the science behind the elephant as well. Cause you know, Grimly, I apologize for the long wait, Grimly. I love your face, Grimly. I love your face. But yeah, welcome on in Neuralisha. Guys, go check out Love Amazing Neuralisha. A little patch of skin that's key to everything you smell. The olfactory epithelium has a layer of olfactory receptor cells, special neurons that sense smells, like the taste buds of your nose. When odor molecules hit the back of your nose, they get stuck in a layer of mucus covering the olfactory epithelium. As they dissolve, they bind to the olfactory receptor cells, which fire and send signals through the olfactory tract 
up to your brain. As a side note, you can tell a lot about how good an animal's sense of smell is by the size of its olfactory epithelium. A dog's olfactory epithelium is 20 times bigger than your puny human one. But there's still a lot we don't know about this little patch of cells too. So it's interesting that actually you can in inherit um, modified olfactory epitheliums due to experience as well throughout um, like the course of your parents' life. There are experiments that are actually demonstrate that if you go from an exposure as a pup, like a mouse, um, or like the father of the father of a pup gets a particular kind of exposure, that offspring will have a differently shaped and different density of neurons in their olfactory epithelium. So it's pretty plastic in that sense. They have more defined piriform cortex that I assume they have a more bombastic smell. So Neuralish, I believe I have a paper ready to pull up about the anatomy of the brain. Here we go. So you have to remember, hi, Bit Gaming. Don't you like me a little bit? You, I don't even like you a little bit. Huh, I heard you like me a little bit. Um, well, maybe just a little bit. A little bit. How you doing, Bit Gaming? Bit Gaming, welcome on in. Spectre, please ask your question, Spectre Flight. Guys, go check out the lovely and amazing breathtaking Bit Gaming, game dev extraordinaire, single greatest father on the planet. And one of our amazing moderators. Hello, Bits Gamey. Welcome in, Big Gamey. Welcome on in. Um, so, Neuralisha, this is the overall structure of the brain. And then, again, it's not as well characterized on elephant brains as it is on other animals. Whether it be other mammals or fruit flies or what have you, just in a model system. There's a lot of inter international regulations on how to actually acquire these samples. And so getting this MRI brain is actually a pretty a pretty big deal. There's not a lot of papers on it, but it actually gives you like a 3D reconstruction on the brain. It doesn't have as much of the labeling and the and the vision, like the the classifications as well as before, but you know, it has the neocortical regions, the cerebellal regions, and then other brain structures as well and in green. So it's a very cursory look and classification of the brain. I think that's in part, it's just because it's not as, you can't validate any of your findings, unlike with other organisms, right? So there are hypotheses as to where these some of these might be. So again, they sliced the brain sample they did a bunch of thin sections to be able to do the imaging. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, the section. So I, neurally, I don't remember how thick the sections were. So one thing y'all can do, like with the fruit fly brain, you can take an extremely thin slice, take a very high res image, and you can ser serial image, meaning you can take them in order of the slicing, and then three D reconstruct them. And if you have really really thin slices, you can make. A beautiful three-dimensional image here I don't remember how many that they actually did but it was a much much thinner section how thin can you go in Drosophila it's some absurd low on the micron level Neuralisha like it is it's thinner than an eyelash when you finally get to it is that we're able to go so a particular like cutting Sight that you can do and it's got this diamond blade on it as long as everything's nice and sharp it's really really thin you have to embed it into a piece of paraffin so a piece of plastic and you're cutting the plastic along with the brain because otherwise it's so so tiny uh, i don't know how it is for mice but that's the way it's able to do it hi captain coder guys if you're not checking out the legendary captain coder you're not doing life right another game dev extraordinaire and a beacon of positivity guys go check out the legendary captain coder how you doing captain is there a and sensory capability for humans to respond to the linguistic structure of an ancestor for general linguistic um so specter that is not something that we're really on topic for tonight and i'm not an expert in and so i don't feel comfortable rabbit holing onto that front because i don't know and so if e if ever we try to look for something it could be very biased depending on where the study was because it's a linguistic study, meaning that you're gonna be influenced based on the population that you're gonna be analyzing. And so if you analyze a given population of how languages they do and you don't do it comparatively, you're not gonna get a straight answer. And so I, d 
because I'm not fully aware of Spectre, I'm not sure that it's appropriate for me to try to answer it or to look up data as well. Captain Coder, or just here, learn Captain Coder. We're talking about some brain components of uh, elephants as well as their smell ability. Um, these slices are looking at the balance that, thank you, Neuralisha. You have to admit when you don't know. Um, I, I, what I can't stand, Neuralisha, is there are some scientists who just like to, to say things. Um, because they want to answer and not because they've actually thought it through so interested in brains you're analyzing ability to recognize human speech that i am analyzing so specter we're not looking at humans these are elephants uh so you don't know and saying so exactly no alicia exactly i 100 percent agree um so Oh, for recognition, so Spectre, there is a recognition study that we can look at later on tonight. Um, here it is. Wait, which one is this? Is it this one? Elephants can determine ethnicity, gender, and age from acoustic, acoustic cues in um, human voices. If that's what you're getting at, that did not, I did not get that that was your question. Um, Oh, see, Spectre, that's a much cleaner question, my friend, because the earlier question did not make much sense in that respect. Um, yes, elephants can recognize human speech and uh, con and at least ethnicity, gender, and age from acoustic cues of humans, yes. No, sorry, Spectre, I just, that's not what you were asking earlier. There was nothing in your question about elephants. Okay, Let's move ahead and jump back to the brain. So just a couple of other images on this front. You do have the hippocampus, which is the learning and memory center of the of the brain. Um, a lot of the similar regions of the brain that we've identified in humans um, and other like mammalian studies as well, primarily in mice that we've identified this. Um, and so they're just looking for structural si uh, similarities. Um, with the structural similarities, they can't prove what these regions do of the brain because there's this is a this was a dead elephant's brain that they got and they were able to section off and take, take images of so they can't go in and test these different things so it is just an assumption that they are working in similar ways to what we've already established in the sense of um like other mammalian studies so it's you know, it's as good as can get. We can see, um, they did try to do some comparative uh, analytics on this. So you can see this red here is the hippocampus. That's the learning and memory center of the brains. And they here they compared three different species. They did elephant, human, and dolphin. And those compare, I, I think the comparative anatomy is actually the coolest on this study because they're trying to hypothesize that you know, like we have the whole question why the elephant doesn't forget, which if y'all are more interested in, we can jump onto that one first because we're kind of really loosey-goosey jumping around tonight. But one hypothesis to why the elephant has such a powerful like memory is again in part because of the enlarged region of the brain for the hippocampus. And again, that's the learning and memory center of just mammalian brains in general, but other animals have equivalents. For example, um, insects have the mushroom body very similar structure same function um just a little structurally different and maybe the neurons are a little bit you know not fully integrated the same way but they do the end, end up same doing the same thing in fact even the genetics of it are quite similar um and i think the dolphin is really cool to see like because we consider dolphins as extremely wow, 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 yip, 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 snoop dog in the his house boys Hello, boys, because of Fab Chat. If you're not checking out Legendary, you're about to take boys, because of Fab, you're doing life right. Boys is an amazing woodcraft extraordinaire. Most handsome man in the state of Texas. Chat, go check out Boyd's Custom Fab. Boyd's, how the heck are you doing, sir? Boyd's, listen, lovely stream today, as always. Okay, as always. Boyd's, we're talking about elephants and their brains. Uh, in particular, don't, don't lie. We're going to nerf that comment, Boyd's. There's no lying in this chat. Boyd's, we're talking about some of the fundamentals of elephant biology. In particular, right now, we've early rabbit-holed into um, 
one of the topics today, which is their brains and how they never forget, right? You've always heard like, oh, an elephant doesn't forget. There is no actual experiment that they can do because it's an endangered species. It's very difficult to work with, right? They have a very long aging and lifespan. So to be able to get, you know, multiple individuals that are age matched, environmentally controlled, and you can test the region of the brain that's firing, it's not gonna happen. However, however, there is the opportunity to do these kinds of comparative and anatomical looks. Um, can we test it to terrify my same thing, Smikes? We cannot like go in and hook up their brains. So you can do like what it is an EEG where you get like the head hooked up, maybe. And there's like some global signaling that you can measure, but you never get at this particular level. So like those EEGs are a lot of surface neurons, right? Like you're looking at the top because you have everything connected here, not looking into the deeper regions of the brain of the organism. What you'd honestly want to do is what we do in mice, which is you have a probe, you, you, you drill us a hole into their skull and then you put a probe into the brain into the particular region of the brain that you're interested in. And when you put the probe in, you connect it to an outside computer and you see when those neurons spike, when you're giving them a certain stimulus. Usually these mice also are hooked up to a wire, right? That's going to the computer and connecting back to it. Um, and so they can't really wiggle around too much. Uh, it's just a very slight movement that they have. Um, now, there was a study a while ago that I think y'all might be interested in and think are kind of kind of cool that I've read about. And I did a little bit of a deeper dive into it before tonight to kind of figure out how exactly it works. And it is the hypothesis that elephants think that we are cute. It turns out that that is wholly inaccurate. Um, that's, that is actually the power of a viral tweet. Um, there was an elephant scientist that tweeted something along those lines and the popular media picked it up and they actually tried to go back and say, no, it was, it's not fully backed up in science. And now if you Google it, half, you know, it's half people can say that it's fact and the other half are like, no, if you look back at the source, there's no citation for it. There's no paper. So if it's a Mythbusters thing, I am concerned that, not that they don't do the science well, but they're just, um, hold on, we can, uh, let me try to find it. There might be some uh, scientific issues behind it. You know, it might not be as uh, clean of a look, but here, let's go ahead. Elephant. It's the first video I found on this. I haven't pre-screened it. Let's go ahead and do it. We can we can always argue if the science is done correctly. Elephants are the Earth's largest land animal. They easily scare most creatures who come across their path because they're big, strong, and very protective of one another. But we're to believe that when they encounter a helpless little mouse, they're shaken with fear. Panic fills the whole herd and they run far and fast deep into the forest. And yes, Smikes, you and boys are very adorable. All because of a tiny little mouse? Let's examine whether this long-held belief is true or misconstrued fact. No one seems to know where this legendary phobia that an elephant has toward mice originated from exactly. Many researchers trace a possible source to ancient Greek time folklore around 77 AD, which claims that a mouse somehow went up the nostrils of an elephant's trunk and made it go berserk. However, this tale lacks In realism. Dreams, one is not tethered by earthly limitations. What does that mean? Come. Sleep well, my last. Sleep well, NMD. Make sure you have a good rest. Stay breathtaking. Stay amazing. 
I love and appreciate your face, ma'am. Sleep well. Thank you for hanging with us, NMD. And uh, know that the elephants love you, NMD96. By the way, chat, we do have a new command if you are subscribed. Exclamation point BFF to show off what NMD is and how breathtaking she actually is. Just exclamation point BFF. You can even at someone. You can even at someone. Yeah, don't let the EU slip through your fingers again, NMD. Don't let the EU slip through your fingers again. Please and thank you. Please and thank you. But yes, boys, you too. You can do exclamation point BFF. There we go. My best horrendo. There we go. Bit, what do you think, Bit Gamey? What do you think? What do you think, Bit Gamey? I hope you enjoy the best friend of Bit Gamey. I, uh, I chuckle far too much at that sound alert bit. Like, it's unsettling how much I think that's funny. It's probably not that funny. But it makes me try. It's from an anime, Smikes. It's from an anime. Yeah. And it's it's like these two dudes are about to have this big fight. And um Yeah. You make me chuckle. Thank you, Quatha Raven. You bring me you make me smile. Hello, Humbler John. Welcome on in as well. Talking about some elephant biology. Hello there. Hello there. Hello there. And we're doing, we're talking about um, doing a little bit of a rabbit hole right now. It was going to be something we talked about, but someone was asking about if elephants are afraid of mice. So we're touching on that front for the moment. Uh, and Big Gamey, you are my, oh, you're one of my best friendos, Big Gamey. How about that, Big Gamey? I'm going to do a giant hug, Big Gamey. Please and thank you, Big Gamey. Just because a mouse would fit into the nostril hole doesn't mean it actually would happen or that it explains the possible long-term generational fear of mice. Not to mention that an elephant's nostril is very sensitive and its sense of smell is four times that of a bloodhound. Again, getting back to that smell component, that's because of the expansion of the olfactory receptor genes. See, the slice, it reminds me of how we're looking through all of my MRI slides from surgery. What's cool about this, Humbler John, is that well it's it's fascinating it's they did individual slices of the brain and then they image those and then piece them back together for the 3d image that is how an mri works but what's cool about it is because it was a brain sample that they got from a dead elephant they're able to go back and keep imaging over and over again it's not just like a one-off like when we go into the mri machine they're not able to get more images unless they actually bring us back to the imager versus here they have all the cuts, um, and they're able to uh, to do that, which I think is neat. Uh, weren't we supposed to be rabbit holing about something else? I can't remember what. Yeah, Quaff, we were about to rabbit hole into their... Well, we wanted to start with the, the odor, and then it was to learning a memory, and now it's back to, to odor and fear of my... It, we're kind of jumping all over the place, Quaff, but it's fine. It's, as long as people are interested, that's why we're here, right? Right? Potentially, possibly, maybe? An elephant can smell water several miles away, primarily because millions of receptor cells are in its upper nasal cavity. In the 1600s, an Irish physician named Alan Moulin came up with a further investigation that concluded that an elephant was fearful of a mouse because it would suffocate if it climbed up its nostril. The reasoning behind this claim is that an elephant cannot breathe through its mouth and would suffocate if a mouse blocked the only air passage to the lung. Today's modern science debunked the physician theory, and we know for a fact that an elephant can breathe through its mouth just like we do. So what would happen if a mouse was brave enough to climb up an elephant's trunk? The answer is simple. It would simply blow the little mouse out with a quick puff of air. But back to the main question, is an elephant scared of a mouse? Not exactly. You see, elephants, like many mammals, get startled when a fast moving animal shoots by them unexpectedly. So, it is not the mouse in particular they're afraid of, which makes sense. It's the same thing as a horse or we aren't afraid of snakes just like just snakes it's the movement that the snake makes that we have this like 
predetermined fear of. And so with a horse, if you move a like a small cut um, watering hose as a snake, they will startle and they'll have the same response as if it were a real snake. So they're not honed in on the actual animal itself, but rather movement. So the same thing can happen where it's not a mouse, but a rat or another small animal and how it moves, that's what's actually contributing to it. An elephant will have a septum-like thing all the way up its trunk, like they bifurcated the whole way up. I, that is a great question, Neuralisha. I am nervous of Googling it because I don't know what, if there's gonna be an unsettling image. I will leave this up and I will Google it on my own off to the side just in case just because the innards one might not gucci be gucci uh, boo -boo -boo. Not a quick answer. Although I did find elephant sperm morphology. If you're interested, we, we can look at elephant sperm morphology. Why that is a thing, I don't know, but there is a whole um, section on it. That's actually interesting. This study is looking at fertility in the, in the animal kingdom and they're looking at fertility in the elephant. Chat. This is very, very off topic, but this is morphology of both wild type and mutant elephant. Um, interesting as ferret indeed. So what you're actually able to look at is struck. This is a normal structured elephant sperm. And then this is one that has a break point and has trouble swimming because of these imperfections near the neck and a little bit further down. So this one, um, this one has an abnormal midpiece. This one has a coiled tail in D. This one has a bent tail. Um, yeah, that is really cool, actually, seeing that. Also, looking at the head of it, there's uh, different densities of cytoplasm. And apparently, those cytoplasmic densities are also um, yielding to different amounts uh, like of how quality they are. And apparently, I guess that makes sense for them to look at if they're banking sperm from the endangered animals, you need to know what's good and what's bad. Uh, elephants have a septum or partition in their trunks that runs the entire length of the trunk from chat GTP, which may or may not be correct, chat. Um, but there might be one. And the spikes was sad because I didn't read the comment right away because I got distracted by a random study on elephant sperm. I can't help it, chat. I can't help it. There's That's interesting. And I didn't know that, that was a thing that we were actively able to look at that I think is quite cool. All right, learn back on the elephants being scared. According to Josh Plotnick, a researcher of elephant behavior and intelligence at the University of Cambridge in England, he said, in the wild, anything that suddenly runs or slithers by an elephant can spook it. It doesn't have to be a mouse, dogs, cats, snakes, or any animal that makes a sudden movement by an elephant's feet can startle it. In addition, Elephants are known to have poor eyesight, which might be another possibility that makes them surprised when a tiny mouse shoots by them, not knowing what went by their feet. Do you get spooked by small animals or bugs? Le you may be an elephant. Um, but no, I think, I think that makes sense as well as it's not particularly the mouse that spooks the animal. It's the size of the, ele the, size of the animal relative to the elephant and it can't see as well and so how it's moving is the thing that actually scares it not the mouse itself i think that makes sense and is an interesting and neato rabbit hole i hope you all think it's kind of cool as well i know i do it's called wicked wall and an elephant listen boys being an elephant is a compliment because you can smell better than most animals you have an amazing memory right you ha are very cultured because they actually have a whole cultural system and you're like adored by millions if not billions of people around the world 
You're a symbol of hope and a beacon of love. So Boyd's, really. Elephants are really cool. Okay. And go back to our smelly smell. Where is my smelly video? We described a banana. Hold on. I'm like totally off now where we are. Here we go. Okay. Back to how we smell. Back to how we great say look, Boyd's. I am full of those. It's the joys. It's when you're married, you have to have all these good saves, Boyd. You have to be ready to go, Boyd. You're like, oh, I said something absolutely insane. And you correct it. Then you correct it. Alright. This, so we were again chatting a little bit about smelling. Not smell as in like I stink, but rather how animals smell, and in particular mammals. And so we're focusing at first on humans. Then we're gonna to touch on the neuroscience of smell and then we'll dive a little bit more into how elephants have that olfactory ability to smell. For example, our olfactory epithelium is pigmented and scientists don't really know why. But how do you actually tell the difference between smells? It turns out that your brain has 40 million different olfactory receptor neurons. This is far more than our usual insects that we talk about. But remember, the way that we can identify how these things work like what, how the odorants work, how the neurons work is by studying it as something simpler. So you can imagine, or I can't, I actually can't imagine working with an animal that has 40 million olfactory receptor neurons and you're trying to turn off one at a time and figuring it out, like how they work and what, I think we've, it's been a quite interesting feature to chat about because it's not especially, there's not a lot known about them it's a limited amount of knowledge. Oh, John, I think what um, Smikes is asking about. Hold on. I'll, I'll. John, this logo right here next to your name, I think that's what... Um, I think that's what Smikes... Oh, oh, it's because it's the three-year affiliate anniversary. John, I feel like that's what you should have left led with. John, it was your three-year affiliate anniversary? John, I feel like that needed much more hype when you came in, John. I apologize. John, I'm disappointed that we did not get that extra hype. Didn't even realize. How dare, John? How dare? How dare, John? But again, welcome on in. Lurk, thank you so much, Skip, for the lurk when you study. Um, so yeah, we were talking actually about um, elephant sperm morphology, how they characterize what's normal, what's wild type, and what's... Um, Mutant, we also are now talking about a little bit about sense perception elephants, in particular odors. And we're touching back on how humans smell and what's the neuroscience on generic mammalian odors and odor detection. And then focusing back from the like human generic ones to the, to the broad reaching elephants. Um, so just some of the things that we're chatting about. Feel free to ask any, all, any and all questions, chat. Um, uh, so go ch go follow our friend toss a coin to your twitcher O Valley of Plenty celebrate my stream anniversary March 25th it's very close to my birthday so maybe I'll celebrate the affiliate anniversary instead no John it's totally Gucci I just was like it's a, it's a new thing they just rolled out today John if you go into your dashboard you can click on a button that has that under your channel settings and it can, you can actually move around the date a little bit. So if you wanted to have it March 25th, maybe you can shift it back and have it like the party be then. I don't remember what the range is for it, but it's definitely something that you can check out. Last, I don't, maybe, I got the email two days ago, something like that. Maybe they rolled it out earlier, but I just got the email for it. But yeah, pretty cool feature, I think. So odor A might trigger neurons three, 427 and 988 and odor B might trigger neurons 8, 76 and 2,496,678. They're just now comparing how if we have 40 million neurons like that detect smell in our brain, one odor might trigger a combination of neurons and then if that combination of neurons triggers, that'll correspond to an odor. And can you imagine right how many combinations that you can have in order to get the odor to be triggered like via the brain you're talking of c number of combinations um which i think is quite remarkable um no rpg fan i have not figured out a way to do that unfortunately sorry rpg 
Um, there, I'm sure there's a way to do it. I have not had the the bandwidth right now to focus, unfortunately. Sorry, RPG panel. It's right over there. The beautiful beadwork. I just... I haven't had the chance. I'm sorry. All of these different combinations let you detect a staggeringly broad array of smells. Plus, your olfactory neurons are always fresh and ready for action. They're the only neuron in the body that gets replaced regularly. Hi, Pimp Cat. How you doing, Pimp Cat? This is actually also a really amazing feature of the odorant neurons that they actually do get replaced. Most neurons, right there, they divide during development and then they're done. Like we in our most of our brain, we do not get any cell division, right? As as when we like our after we're born. So these neurons, the olfactory neurons, are quite unique on that front. Every four to eight weeks. Once those neurons are triggered, the signal travels through a bundle called the olfactory tract to destinations all over your brain, making stops in the amygdala, the thalamus, and the neocortex. This is different from how sight and sound are processed. Each of those signals goes first to a relay center in the middle of the cerebral hemisphere, and then out to other regions of the brain. But smell, because it evolved before most of your other senses, takes a direct route to these different regions of the brain, where it can trigger your fight or flight response, help you recall memories, or make your mouth water. But even though we've all got the same physiological setup, two nostrils and millions of olfactory neurons, not everybody smells the same things. One of the most famous examples of this is the ability to smell so-called asparagus pee. And so this I think is really cool and it's a feature that we don't know about in other animals. It's so like how much genetic variance there is in the ability to detect odors. Like yes, we know their odorant receptors are expanded, but presumably there's other genes that are also influencing their ability to smell. Home from work a bit ago. How was work, Pim Cat? I hope it went well. Bell peppers for you, Risto. Particular color of bell pepper or any bell pepper? And Risto, this is going to be a weird question, but we're going to ask it. After you eat asparagus, does your pee smell funny? Does your pee smell funny after eating asparagus? If it does, you have a particular gene that can detect the odor of a breakdown product from asparagus. If you don't smell anything, you're missing that gene that particular olfactory receptor. It's not that your body doesn't break it down the same way that someone else's body does. It's just you lack the ability to smell that enzymatic byproduct. And it's a very easy experiment to do. Uh, you, Yep, you do have that particular gene AZ and not everyone has that, which is quite fascinating. Drink Italian coffee today. No, 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 so Risto, you would have to eat asparagus in order to smell it. So it has nothing to do with coffee. It's eating of asparagus. It could be cooked asparagus. It could be raw asparagus. It could be whatever. Um, but it's when you pee, the breakdown product is a function, is it like creates a unique odor that you may or may not be able to smell. It's all dependent on if you have one particular gene. And if your pee smells funny, maybe it was an asparagus on the plate. Is that, oh, that's true, Big Gaming. That's very true, Big Gaming. And I, AZ, I'm also one of y'all's buddies as well. Uh, we're talking about it. My pee always smells coffee-ish. Really, Rista? I've never smelled coffee pee. I'm pretty good at recognizing what uh, cologne people are wearing. Nice, Pimp Cat. There are Pimp Cat... So there are humans that can see extra colors. There are humans that can also smell a broader array of odors um, than the average. So you might be one of those super smellers. Yes, the asparagus pea gene is weird, but I think Smike's more what it is is probably the enzymatic byproduct. There might have been something throughout the course of our evolution that made us want to avoid anything with that byproduct is one hypothesis for it. And then since now we maybe gained the ability to break down that product and it's not toxic anymore to us, now it doesn't really matter. And so it, you can imagine it being a deterrent at certain times like if you smell this stay away from it in terms of like any kind of food smell right but now that we can break it down it's only to turn after you pee it it's like oh that's kind of grody and then you went you go on your merry way but yeah risto next time you eat some asparagus smell your pee a few hours later they actually had us do that in my genetics class in high school they served us it was like a lunch class that time they served us um asparagus and send us to the restroom after to smell RP. Similar taste soap. It's similar RPG in so far as it is controlled by a single gene, but it's not similar because it's not olfactory or smell based. It's um, taste taste based for cilantro 
and different for um the odor one hi tigger first time chatter or is it tiger me now either one is gucci fan you agreed to boost my milk supply when my kids were infants always had to let your doctor know because it passes through the milk and make the baby smell like maple syrup so tigger interesting point um we had heard that as well that fenugreek was supposed to boost uh milk production because we just had our first kiddo and we were looking to like make sure like to try to boost the milk production right and fenugreek was also suggested to us oh ti double go er that spells tigger i got you now i got you um it turns out that that is actually a not confirmed hypothesis nowadays so we we asked one of our um doctor friends if it was like what to do and she said like go go get go grab this uh fenugreek but the lactation specialist says no you stop taking it right now your lactation consultant recommended it. ours told us don't which is wild guys go check out supernatural writer love you supernatural writer it was a lot though yeah tigger it was it's a very difficult um it was a very difficult time and trying to like get it because our, our little one is three months old um just had her not too long ago here she is as a, as a baby she's just so cute duty i guess it's 10 so i may have i i think that must have been it tigger um hi keen welcome in keen john thank you for the lurk i think it was because my mom's a pediatrician too and she suggested that plus there's other dietary supplements that she she suggested as well whose byproducts used to be increasing of lactation and now the lactation specialists are like no that's no longer the case and so it's this weird balancing act now of figuring out like what it is there she is right now um are lactation specialists doctors nurses i have no idea spikes i it depends on who you talk to um we talked to some uh risto go get some good sleep risto love your face risto we talked to some doctors um who are very angry about the prospect of there being lactation specialists because they think it's designed to make a mother feel bad and there's other ones who say who say it's very useful so there it's a i don't think md smikes i don't think md um Baby's definitely chiming in, Daisy. Yeah, there are one capsule three times that I work with. So that's what we were starting at Tigger, and then we were told to absolutely stop because apparently, in some cases now, it's been shown to actually do the opposite. I have no idea. But we still have the bottle here. We still have the bottle, I think, upstairs. Uh, help me. There's huge warning to the research for the, in the form of fenugreek. Yep, 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 yep. It's it's it, it's you know it's one of those weird case by case things and i you know we started it and actually we did see a corresponding decrease with at that time so it's it's a weird and hard balancing act you never know what you're supposed to do on that front but luckily i guess there are maybe specialists to help i don't know oatmeal lita did that and uh oat milk or not oat, oat milk um well there oat milk too and oat beer oat based beer like guinnesses apparently also help as well um and there were a couple of other ex suggestions as well on that front but it was like guinness beer was supposed to really help certification process varies by state that's also yeah that doesn't surprise me smikes for the lactation specialist but yeah she just turned three months old and she is chuckling at my jokes az she is chuckling at my jokes there's her first smile it's the background of my phone because it's adorable and let's see. I think I have Smikes' favorite photo. That's Smikes' favorite photo. Smikes doesn't understand. Together, we can the galaxy. <laughs> Cliff House from McLean, thank you for the 15 month resub! Thank you so much, Cliff. Welcome to Hacking Cliff. How you doing tonight, Cliff? We're talking about some elephant biology today. Obsessed with the lightly iced whole milk co whole oat cookies. Oh, okay. Tigger. Lita was making those as well. And this was unfortunate, Tigger. So she was making cookies like in the middle of the night, right? These oat cookies. It's exactly what you're doing and talking about. And I got confused and I thought they were for me. And so I would eat a bunch of these cookies. 
<laughs> they were not they, they I mean they were for sharing but they weren't just for me um, they were very delicious though they were very tasty cookies um, we're talking a little bit about elephant biology cliff I would love to talk about some elven ones too but I don't know how much data there are about elves so far Cliff Alistair McLean but the elephants it's pretty good right now we're talking about their ability to smell elephants have an expanded olfactory receptor repertoire allowing them to smell at many more order, odors than other mammalian counterparts. And we're talking right now, Cliff, introducing the concept of how mammals smell different odors, in particular humans. We're going to talk about the neuroscience of it and then bring it back to um, elephants after that. Yep, no heffalumps, heffalumps, no woozles, but we do have Tigger. D-I double gut er that spells Tigger! Tigger, meow, by the way, my little sister's, one of her favorite movies as a tiny kiddo was the Tigger movie. And we watched that an obscene number of times when I, because there's an eight year gap between her and I. She's a young, my little sister, right? And we watched that so many times. And then recently after Baby Alona was born, um, Lita and I watched the Tigger movie again. And you know what? It holds up. It still holds up to this day. Tigger is quite lovely. I still don't like how Eeyore is always sad, but you know, he doesn't, he wasn't as sad or it didn't feel as sad um, in this movie. Uh, Neuralisha gonna lurk a mode, get ready for bed. Sleep well, Neuralisha. You're breathtaking, Neuralisha. Got the name as a teen. Tigger, did you jump around or were you striped? Or was it neither? Hi, V. How you doing, V? Thank you, Neuralisha. You're amazing, Neuralisha. V, did you know that I want to give you a high five? V, can I give you a high five? Do I have permission, V game? V tries to chat to give you a high five. V, may I? May I, V? Please? My best horrendo. There we go. Thank you, V. Thank you, V, for letting me give you a high five. Chat, go check out our lovely, amazing friend, V, who is a little bit of a silly willy. They are quite breathtaking. Go check out V. If you don't, um, he will get very angry. He wants seven eighths of the Earth's or population following before the end of the calendar year, and he's addicted to offline hype trains and chickens, and it's it's, it's maddening. But he's he's breathtaking. He's got a hurt back because he carries so many of us on our, on his back. You know, he's breathtaking. He's breathtaking, and uh, and we love V to the extreme level. V, I hope you've had a great day, V. We were talking about elephants and um, olfaction and smell in mammals. Welcome on in. For about a quarter of the population, urinating after eating asparagus means smelling a distinct odor. The other 75% of us don't notice. And this isn't the only case of smells differing from nose to nose. For some people, the chemical androstenone smells like vanilla. To others, it smells like sweaty urine. Which is unfortunate, because androstenone is commonly found in tasty things like pork. So with the sweaty urine smellers in mind, pork producers will castrate male pigs to stop them from making androstenone. The inability to smell a scent is called Yep, like I, I don't, I guess salty urine smikes is one way to do it. One way to do that. Yeah. Anosmia, and there are about a hundred known examples. People with illicit anosmia can't smell garlic. Those with eugenol anosmia can't smell cloves. And some people can't smell anything at all. This kind of full anosmia could have several causes. Some people are born without a sense of smell. Others lose it after an accident or during an illness. If the olfactory epithelium gets swollen or infected, it can hamper your sense of smell, something you might have experienced when you were sick. And not being able to smell anything can mess with your other senses, too. Many people who can't smell at all also can't really taste the same way the rest of us do. It turns out that how something tastes is closely related to how it smells. As you chew your food, air is pushed up your nasal passage, carrying with it the smell of your food. Those scents hit your olfactory epithelium and tell your brain a lot about what you're eating. Without the ability to smell, you lose the ability to taste anything more complicated than the five tastes your taste buds can detect. Sweet, salty, bitter, sour, and savory. So the next time you smell exhaust fumes, salty sea air, or roast chicken, you'll know exactly how you've done it. And perhaps be a little more thankful that you can. So that's the fundamental for mammalian uh, detection of odors. Hi, Annika. I know that some who lost her sense of smell after brain surgery for cancer. Yep, that's definitely... Annika, even um, after COVID infection, right? There are reports of individuals losing their ability to smell from viral infections, which is quite 
wild to think about that you know after a viral infection you can lose a sense of smell and kind of scary too guys what's not scary is if you go follow our friend Annika who's an amazing cake maker extraordinaire please go follow Annika is it Unami I yeah Smikes wasn't there another taste though on top of that was it Unami I feel like there was another one as well but I can't remember what it was but I, I will default to you if it's just a savory. I, I default to your expertise, my friend. Um, okay, a brief foray into the neuroscience. Found this neat video series of two-minute neuroscience where they're just looking at very quickly to look at how like a, a neuronal feature works in two minutes. So it's looking at the sense of olfaction again in mammals, so how, sen how s they smell. Ross and friends knew all about the unagi bit. I can see it in my mind when he says it. But I cannot remember the context. It's been a long enough time where I do not remember the context. Grandma's sense of taste was ruined by COVID. She fell and hit her head a year later. Reset. Really reset everything. Uh, everything tastes good again and brand new as if she never had things before. It's oh, it's crazy, Annika. Huh. I wonder what the connection was there. Yes, Pimp Cat. Some people can't smell garlic. Hi, Kanara. I'm glad you said hello to Big Gaming. But can I? Can you say hi to me as well, Kanara? Please. Can you say hi to me as well? I know you said hi to Big Gaming. But hi, Kanara. Hi, Kanara. Uh, unagi is a state of total awareness, achieving true unagi. Prepare for any danger that may befall you. Gotcha, Big Gaming. Sounds about right. Go. I mean Big Gaming. I know you meant Big Gaming. Kenar, I know you meant Big Gaming. It's okay. Big Gaming's extremely handsome. He's also he's also married with beautiful children, and he actually won the Best Father of the Year award for the past 19 years running. It's wild, Kanara. You know what else is wild, folks? If you're not checking out Kanara, legendary Twitch food and drink streamer, extraordinaire food safety, do delicious food items, and folks, and on the path to Twitch ambassador, folks, please go follow the legendary and breathtaking, amazing Kanara before she hits Twitch ambassador. Because if she if you she hits Twitch ambassador before you're able to you know go follow, then you'll feel like a silly pants. And you don't want to feel like a silly pants, folks. Go check her out and follow. Go check her out and follow. One of those people are vampires, maybe Pimcat. 20 years? Gotcha, big game. Gotcha. Sad I missed out on the last round. Kanara, do you receive any feedback? Right? Because I think when we last chatted, you said that there's, right, we talked about there's only a single, it's a one off application. And because it's that one off application, you're kind of just stuck. And there's, you're not going to get any feedback, and you're just put into the pile for the next cycle. Is that still the case, Kanara? At COVID, there were some days I could very specifically not taste sour things. They felt sour, but they didn't taste sour. I get that, Cliff. I have yet to get COVID, though. Always next round. I wish they told you if it was a no and why. Do you have to reapply for the next round, Kanara, or just the applications go into the pot for the next round? My memory is it just stays in the pot and you can't reapply again. It's just that same application. Um, which makes it all the more stressful, right? Because if you wanted to rewrite it and add certain things to it, you know, it's just hard to know. But yeah, they did announce a new Twitch ambassador is today. Um, Kanara, I don't know if you noticed, there was one who um, put Saren wrap on their face. Yeah. All right, two minutes in neuroscience, folks, of how mammals detect odors, chat. How do mammals detect odors? Two minute neuroscience, right? They say no, but when I filled out the form, I thought that was the pre-form. I get, but that's not the preform, right, Kanara? You have an ant question? Go ahead. We're talking about elephants, Kanara. But right now, I'll take your ant question. Go ahead and ask, Kanara. Ask, and you shall receive a potential possible answer. Gotcha. It's the real form. Elephants. Let's go. That's our ambassador, Pooj Kanara, but also <laughs> elephants indeed big gaming. The ants I get every year, 
they are active 24 7 which may wonder do ants ever sleep so ants do sleep all insects sleep their sleep is different from us they do have a circadian rhythm canara which like us they're active at different parts of the day like more active in some parts and less active in others it is not the same kind of sleep pattern that a mammal would have so instead of where we lay down and we sleep for x number of hours insects have micro naps so sleep in an, in an insect is defined as a period of no movement for 30 seconds or more and the way they measure it is they have these glass tubes and a laser shining through the center and when the like when the animal crosses the beam that means that they're awake when the animal does not cross the beam an x amount of time that's called a, that would be a sleep phase and so it's yeah it, it's very variable on how long they sleep it's that is dependent on their circadian rhythm so there are periods of more activity they might still like stop moving for 30 seconds and have a short like nap you have to think about naps and sleep on a molecular level where there is a, like expression of proteins that we also have the period gene is one of those that regulates sleep and uh cry is the one that regulates sleep in the opposite direction so what period goes up cry goes down cry then goes up and period goes down so there's like they're cross talking and regulating each other and you know one allows you to be more active during the day other one allows you to be more active at night or vice versa um and those are some of the features behind it so those on a molecular level is the same in an insect as they are in a mammal it's just how the sleep manifests is different uh, does that make sense, Madam? Does that make sense to our Queen Kanara? I hope I hope that's a potentially clean cut argument, ma'am. Also, lovely stream today. It looked absolutely delicious, and uh, yeah, it's always a good time there, Kanara. Always a good time. All right, let's go, m m move on the uh, the neuroscience of smell. Then learn something every time I'm here. <laughs> Thank you, Kanara. You're breathtaking, ma'am. Explain neuroscience topics in two minutes or less. In this installment, I will discuss olfaction. Olfaction refers to the sense of smell, which begins with a specialized collection of cells called the olfactory epithelium. In humans, the olfactory epithelium lines the nasal cavities. The olfactory epithelium contains millions of olfactory receptor cells. And this is the same for not just humans, but other mammals as well. So when we start looking at um, like the elephant, mouse what have you it's the same concept that's illustrated here very different from our insects but in mammals it's conserved these cells have a single dendrite that extends to the outermost layer of the epithelium where cilia emerge from the end of the dendrite and spread over the surface of the olfactory epithelium when odorants enter the nasal cavity due to inhalation or by rising from the mouth during the chewing of food they stimulate receptors on the cilia depolarizing the olfactory receptor cells and initiating action potentials that travel down the axon of the receptor cell into an adjacent structure called the olfactory bulb. These axons that Chat, we have to pause everything. Silly in the air, yes, Mike. It's like silly in the air. Chat, we have to stop everything. We have a birthday person here. Chat, olfaction and smell in the context of why elephants are able to smell so well. May I just leave the cake? That does happen, Crystal. That does happen. Uh, but welcome the heck in, Lenina. Travel from the olfactory epithelium to the olfactory bulb together make up the first cranial nerve. So they're giving you like the basic morphology of how the smell looks. So these are the cilia in your nose and na nasal cavity. And there's a, a series of neurons that connect and they go then deeper into the brain, into the olfactory bulb, whereas you're able to, like there's your sense of smell and how that happens. Uh, they were at school all day, so they made you food at school. That is amazing, Lenina. I'm so glad that they took the time at school to make you some lovely food. And if not, they will make it up to you over the weekend by cooking for you and caring on your every whim for both days of the weekend. Because we both know, Lenina, that you're an amazing mom and you, you deserve this like legendary treatment. Right? 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 Yes. In the olfactory bulb, the axons of the olfactory receptor cells converge on the dendrites of olfactory bulb neurons in small clusters called glomeruli. My husband and I did just beat Red Skull and Marvel Champion, so it was a great day. Nice, Alinea. 
But also, I hope you have a delicious meal and lovely gifts and um, all the fancy items that your heart desires. Please and thank you. In these glomeruli, the receptor cells form synaptic connections with several types of olfactory bulb neurons, including cells called mitral cells and tufted relay neurons. Both of these cells project into the olfactory tract, a bundle of fibers that carries olfactory information to the olfactory cortex, where most olfactory processing occurs. The olfactory cortex consists of a collection of cortical areas that receive information from the olfactory bulb, including the piriform cortex, an area of cortex surrounding the amygdala known as the periamygdaloid cortex, the entorhinal cortex. So they're just not going into different regions of the brain that are being connected to and speaking about the odors detected by us humans. Remember our look at the morphology of the structure of the elephant brain had similar regions mapped out as well. So those are some of the why we're highlighting and focusing and pointing out some of these regions because they're very similar between different mammals like the structure is conserved between them barbecue and cake heck yeah the linea i could use some barbecue too and two regions known as the olfactory tubercle and anterior olfactory nucleus so that's just the base model of how this works there's far more advanced models that we can delve into but since that wasn't too much the focus i just wanted to highlight the cursory look of how their sensory neurons on the outside these are the ones that get turned over the reason they get turned over is because they're exposed to the elements and they just are more likely to break down and die they connect to these oh glomeruli or other neuronal um cells inside of the brain and that's then connected to uh, the other processing centers in the individual and so you can activate different neurons and different receptors for odors of our 40 million that humans have which elephants have even more and those combinations correspond to a different smell which is quite remarkable that that kind of system works now how do elephants smell let's get to the elephant smell hold on Give me one moment, chat, to find my video. Okay. Yeah, there it is. Smikes knows the, uh, the, the craziness in terms of the tabs that I have, and so Smikes is, like, chuckling right now. All right. Let's go ahead and continue, folks. As a breeze blows through the savanna, a snake-shaped tube stretches into the air and scans the horizon like a periscope. But it's not seeing, it's sniffing for odors like the scent of a watering hole or the musk of a dangerous predator. The trunk's owner is a young African elephant. At only eight years old, she still has a lot to learn about her home. Fortunately, she's not alone. Elephants are extremely social creatures, with females living in tight-knit herds led by a single matriarch. And every member of the group has one of the most versatile tools in the savanna to help them get by. Today, her herd is looking for water, or more accurately, smelling for water. Elephants have more genes devoted to smell than any other creature, making them the best sniffers in the animal kingdom. Even at our elephant's young age, her trunk is already 1.5 meters long and contains five times as many olfactory receptors as a human nose. Human nose, remember, has 40 million, five times as many. So just the math is absolutely crazy time on that. So elephants are far superior to that smell ability compared to us. Hello, Papa Bear. Welcome on in. We're talking about some elephant biology today, in particular about olfaction. So smell detection between uh, different individuals. We're looking. We, we're talking about the fundamentals of mammalian smell detection, and now we're focusing in on elephant smell detection. Welcome the heck in. Scepters as a human nose, allowing her to smell standing water several kilometers away. And now the matriarch uses her own keen sense of smell. 
which is actually quite interesting on just the ability for these animals to smell water. There's a fair number of animals that again just can detect humidity in the air, even um, something as quote unquote simple as a fruit fly or a mosquito can seek out and detect the smell of, um, of water. Immediately made me wonder about the elephants versus humans' ability to smell rain, given how sensitive humor it's at. So, Pop Bear, it turns out, elephants are even more sensitive than we are to the ability of... Because, like, maybe the smell of... The smell of rain, I think, also has other compounds in it as well that we're detecting. It's not just the water, but it's also other potential breakdown products that are happening in there. Um, so, there's just a lot, other, a lot of other factors, not purely the water that we're only detecting. It's kind of neat. To plot the herd's course. Their journey is long, so our elephant keeps her energy up by snacking on the occasional patch of thick grass. But this light lunch isn't just about staying fed. She's also looking for clues. Like many other mammals, vents in the roof of an elephant's mouth lead directly to the vomeronasal organ. This structure can detect chemical and we have that as well, right? That's how we're able to get um, tastes, right? We talked about in the other video that there's five fundamental tastes that we're able to have with the buds on a tongue versus uh, many, many more that you get from odors. And so that connection between your the roof of your mouth and then to the, the organ that's in the brain actually detecting the odors allows you to get flavor, which I think is quite remarkable. So the right before it does that, I, AVO2 is a big part elephant. Crystal, there are variances between different individuals, but you know, I like I can also smell like when it's about to rain, there's a different odor that occurs, and that's probably an increase in humidity that it's coming in. So there's a bunch of other factors as well, um, which I think is quite remarkable anyway. But there are differences, Crystal. So we were talking about earlier. Some people can smell more than others, and some people can smell far less. Like there's different, like missing receptors. Like some people can't smell garlic. Other people can't smell um, the the breakdown product in asparagus, right, in, in your pee versus like some can. And there's also people that can't smell at all. Smell of rain isn't about rain at all for humans. Compounds that people are so sensitive to are called picture vor, which is a bacteria found in soil. Yes, so therefore, Papa Bear, right? They're not smelling water, like, um, at least not the same way that elephants are. They're pre smelling, right? Yeah. Chemical signals left by other elephants. So, as the herd forages, they're also gathering information about what other herds have come this way. All the while, the group's adults are on the lookout for signs of other animals, including potential threats. Fortunately, while lions might attack a young or sickly elephant, few are foolish enough to take on a healthy adult. Weighing three tons and bearing powerful tusks nearly a meter long, our elephant's mother is a force to be reckoned with. Her dexterous trunk doubles as a powerful, flexible arm. Containing no bones and an estimated 40,000 muscles, these agile appendages can bend, twist, contract, and expand. At eight years old, our elephant's trunk is already strong enough to move small fallen trees, while finger-like extensions allow for delicate maneuvers like wiping her eye. She can even grab a nearby branch, break it to just the right length, and wave off pesky insects. It is, Papa Bear. What gets me too is that they can use their trunk like a finger because there's muscles above and below and they can use it to pinch things for like very delicate movement. And then also like they were mentioning of picking up whole logs as well. So the trunk itself has some really amazing biology. Suddenly, the matriarch stops their march and sniffs the air. Using smell alone, elephants can recognize each member of their herd and their exceptional memories can retain the smells of elephants outside their herd as well. It's one of these old but- Which we'll talk about the memory next because there is a difference in their hippocampus. So that's the region of their, their learning and memory region of their brain. In elephants, it's much, much bigger. 
in fact than in humans and we think that may account for their ability to remember things so well that cannot be proven because the experiments haven't been done no one's actively working on genetically perturbing an elephant um so it's very structural hypothesis and morphology driven but it's still something cool to keep in mind familiar odors that's caught the matriarch's attention she bellows into the air sending out a sound wave that rings across the savanna but it gives me the name of an important bacteria compound named petrichor smell it's an alcohol gotcha thank you cliff petrichor smell yes travels even further through the earth as infrasonic rumbles. Elephants up to 10 kilometers away can receive these rumbles with their feet. If the matriarch's nose is right, her herd should expect a response. Smelling the secretions from her daughter's temporal glands, our elephant's mother can sense her daughter's unease about this unfamiliar encounter. As the herd of unknown elephants approaches, Trunks from both herds rise into the air, sounding trumpets of alarm. But upon recognition, apprehension quickly gives way to happy rumbles. Members from each herd recognize each other despite time apart, and many investigate each other's mouths with their trunks to smell what their counterparts have been eating. With the reunion now in full swing, both herds head toward their final destination, the long-awaited watering hole. Here, older elephants suck up to eight liters of water into their trunks before spraying the contents on themselves to cool off. Meanwhile, our young elephant plays in the mud with her peers, digging into the muck and even using her trunk as a snorkel to breathe while submerged. The pair of matriarchs look contentedly on their herds before turning their trunks to the horizon once more. Ever wonder if the saying, an elephant never forgets, is true? Take a look inside the incredible, unforgettable minds of Earth's gentle giants to find out with this video. Which is actually where we're gonna go to next. Um, elephants use their ears as radiators too. Yes, they're not the only animals that do that. The large ears are a way to off, offset heat. Jackrabbits in a desert area such as like Arizona, also have large ears for the exact same reasoning as like an, a way to offshoot that heat which is having a large surface area and like all the the arteries and the veins spread out along that ear to disseminate the heat which is quite cool i think okay let us jump on the elephant brain science i just want to revisit this image that we looked at in the paper because I think it's really striking to look at the comparative anatomy between the the hippocampus of these animals. So again, that's the learning and memory center. If you look at the elephant's brain, the human brain, as well as um, the dolphin brain, right? In marked in red is that learning and memory center that we've talked about in uh, in insects, right? The that's the mushroom body equivalent. Um, it's just really, really cool to see it like these are like they're on the similar scale that scale bar is a centimeter and you can see how much larger they are in different of these organisms. And, you know, we consider dolphins really, really smart, but they're relatively speaking are, are smaller than, let's say, the elephant or even the humans. And so one part that might be what accounts for their intelligence again and their inability to forget or lack thereof. It hasn't been as fully looked at as in other organisms like mouse and whatnot, but it's definitely something just to keep in mind for how the biology works. It's a common saying that elephants never forget. But these magnificent animals are more than giant walking hard drives. The more we learn about elephants, the more it appears that their impressive memory is only one aspect of an incredible intelligence that makes them some of the most social, creative, and benevolent creatures on Earth. Unlike many proverbs, the one about elephant memory is scientifically accurate. 
Elephants know every member. And we did talk about the one that, um, their fear of mice, which has been disproven. It's not in particular about mouse fear, but rather fear about small animal movement and how the movement happens. In their herd, able to recognize as many as 30 companions by sight or smell. This is a great help when migrating or encountering other potentially hostile elephants. They also remember and distinguish particular cues that signal danger and can recall important locations long after their last visit. But it's the memories unrelated to survival that are the most fascinating. Elephants remember not only their herd companions, but other creatures who have made a strong impression on them. In one case, two circus elephants that had briefly performed together rejoiced when crossing paths 23 years later. This recognition isn't limited to others of their species. Elephants have also recognized humans they've bonded with after decades apart. All of this shows that elephant memory goes beyond responses to stimuli. Looking inside their heads, we can see why. By the way, I don't know about y'all, but I really, really love elephants. They are such an amazing animal. The elephant boasts the largest brain of any land mammal, as well as an impressive encephalization quotient. This is the size of the brain relative to what we'd expect for an animal's body size, and the elephant's EQ is nearly as high as a chimpanzee's. And despite the distant relation, convergent evolution has made it remarkably similar to the human brain. That's why we're able to do that structural comparison in that previous figure, right? So what convergent evolution is meaning is that as we're evolving, the same structures are coming out repeatedly. Like once nature has found something that works, it's not gonna reinvent the wheel every time. And so it's having similar structures that we can then compare and have information of what might be and how the animal's brain works based on just that comparison. Body size to brain thing was squishy. It's squishy smikes in so far as it's an anecdotal hypothesis. It doesn't mean that they are gonna be smarter um, that's it used to be smikes people used to say like if there's the ratio of, of brain to body size is that particular number then it, it means they're more intelligent that doesn't seem to hold up but there does seem to be an evolutionary connection between things like lifespan and complexity with that because the more space the brain is taking up the more possibility for there being like more advanced and that's a human term on that behaviors in the organism even like such a like like uh, social social systems and things like along those lines but it's it's it is as you say a squishy metric with as many neurons and synapses in a highly developed hippocampus and cerebral cortex it is the hippocampus strongly associated with emotion that aids recollection by encoding important experiences into long-term memories the ability to distinguish this importance makes elephant memory a complex and adaptable faculty beyond- No dumb question, Smikes. Wouldn't you think carnivores would be more intelligent because of protein? That is not a dumb question at all. I think there has been suggestions and studies saying that things eating a more of a protein-based diet would grow, be able to grow a larger brain. I think I, if I, I cannot remember what it was, but I believe there is something in the elephant's diet that is high in protein. And that ends up like uh, uh, accounting for that. But it, it's because big brains are energetically costly. And so having things such as protein should help the brain, like feed the brain. It's brain food is what we're trying to get at. So omnivores and carnivores tend to be better suited for larger brains because of that but it's not entirely clear like there's always a couple of animals that seem to buck the truth. one second why we rabbit hole here a lot for the new people coming on in meaning that we enjoy talking about a bevy of different topics and if there's ever a question about something we do hop around and so this is, was one of the topics of fertility and elephants. Again, I don't remember how we got here, but this is like some of the structural differences between um, elephant sperm of how you can actually categorize what's healthy and what's not. And why that's even important is if we're trying to save a species and our banking sperm to do IVF, 
you have to be able to recognize what morphology is correct and to have a range of morphology of structures that may or may not be good for the organism. Uh, but right now we were talking about their brains. In particular, their hippocampus. So that's marked in red here. The hippocampus is the learning and memory center of mammals. Uh, it also exists in insects and other organisms, but it's not called it. That, Grimley, you can get on Amazon or you can go to the Benda store online and you can buy it directly from them. And that is like the best imported paprika available in the US. It's a Chicago based company. Uh, I would actually love to see Smikes go to the um, primary like store. A spike, spicy Tyler. They have spicy paprika. It is most grimly the McCormick is terrible. And the way you can tell that is the color. It's not a bright, vibrant red, but like a dark brown. And the dark brown is over dried and not flavorful. It's just like, it tastes kind of like filler versus if you get the really vibrant red color that has much more flavor and is much more tasty. Um, and so it's, I have a friend who always jokes around me that say, he says Spanish paprika is superior. I have no idea, but he always says that because um, he like he, he thinks it's funny to grind my gears. Uh, the elephant size is so big. Uh, so pre, it is so large because they uh, it's it's their ability for their learning and memory behavior. Um, and so yeah, the the whole part of the brain is massive. It's comparative anatomy between the brains of a human a dolphin and an elephant. And it highlighted in red is the hippocampus, that learning and memory center. Um, most spices, herbs add too many fillers. I got it right. Ex yeah, grimly, that's totally the thing that there is just so much um, like extra stuff in some of these that you can't really get any of the good deliciousness out of it. Um, so you got it right on point, grimly. Is the morphology so similar between Asian and African elephants in these videos? So, I have seen Smikes, when I was doing this for a very little in terms of comparative anatomy, and I wonder if it's just the lack of having the samples to compare with. I'm wondering if that's what the holdup was, because we didn't see or we have not seen, I have not seen any comparative anatomy between the two. It might be something that we're just missing, but definitely I'll, I'll, I can look into a little bit further. But all the papers I found were examining the African elephant. In fact, all the extra things that we've learned about and like the, the mouse story, the water detection, the not forgetting, like all of them have been in African elephants. And again, why? I'm not entirely sure why they went with that front, but that's what they ended up going with. And again, it might just be availability of sample. I know there's a very, the Asian elephants, you know, located in China and India, they're under usually um, scientific embargoes, not just elephants, but most samples from those countries. So for example, Smikes, remember we talked about the Indian jumping ant, the Harbignath the Saltator? The only labs in the United States that have them are from samples that were collected in the 70s. You cannot now go to India and take those samples back to the US because they have been deemed to have scientific value and so they are not allowed to be removed from the country. It must be a similar law that they have against um, some of these other ones too. MRIs in India, it's, uh, but in part, brief, it's funding that's present there and also equipment and how the experiments are planned to be designed and the dissemination of those data are also very different because there are legal factors coming in. Thank you, Hiptacraptor. How are you doing tonight? Like pandas. Well, pandas don't have bio, like scientific significance. I think those are just a cultural symbol, I think. All right, let's continue the video. Beyond rote memorization. It's what allows elephants who survived a drought in their youth to recognize its warning signs in adulthood, which is why clans with older matriarchs have higher survival rates. 
Unfortunately, it's also what makes elephants one of the few non-human animals to suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. The cerebral cortex, on the other hand, enables problem solving, which elephants display in many creative ways. They also tackle problems cooperatively, sometimes even outwitting the researchers and manipulating their partners. That is not true, Brick Lane, but welcome on in. That is not true anymore. That has been disproven for many years now. But welcome on in, friendo. Hope you're doing well. And they've grasped basic arithmetic, keeping track of the relative amounts of fruit in two baskets after multiple changes. The rare combination of memory and problem solving can explain some of elephant's most clever behaviors, but it doesn't explain some of the things we're just beginning to learn about their mental lives. Elephants communicate using everything from body signals and vocalizations to infrasound rumbles that can be heard kilometers away, and their understanding of syntax suggests that they have their own language and grammar. This sense of language may even go beyond simple communication. Elephants create art by carefully choosing and combining different colors and elements. Beautiful image. Fun fact number two, I've been lied to this regard. No, Brick Lane, you're not the only one. I was told that growing up as a kid, that that was a 100% confirmed thing, right? And for a very long time, I thought that was the case. And recent studies have proven that like left-handedness and right-handedness of the brain and how it correlates if we're right or left-handed and like if we're artistic or not, it turns out that like with recent studies with like higher resolution imaging and more mapping of the brain, that that's a bunch of baloney. And it's a little bit disappointing, but it also, I guess, makes sense, Brick Lane, that it's not true because of just how complex our brains are. There's so many billions of neurons in there and how they interconnect. Um, yeah, I think it's pretty cool. I think Serpentina, it, it began with because there were experiments where there were regions of the brain removed and it led to different, like this is like when lobotomies were a big thing and it led to differences in behavior and that's where these hypotheses began. Is a bologna just more complex than being simple? I think Andrew, it's for me, I would take it as baloney because the way I understood the original argument was that sightedness dicta was dictated by like if you're right or left handed and it's also dictated by if you're more artistic or if you're more like 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 different kinds of learning. But it turns out that removing certain like if you actually nerf certain halves of the brain like that will not actually correspond to loss in those abilities. So that to me was that they had a very small sample size and they may have cut a few extra neurons and that's what led to the conclusion and that's led to like this false information i think it's just neuronal mapping now is is deeper and more the yes is far more complex than what we know but it's also just factually incorrect that it's totally symmetrical and there's sidedness to it or or, or that there's sidedness to it like there's there's a combination of things happening in there does that is that a fair Andrew? It might not be fair. It might be I could be argued into the other direction as well that it's you know it's more complex than being simple. But I I took it as it was just like the facts itself was incorrect on that front. A bologna sandwich, me too, big gaming. Why my dad had some pressure to build up his left brain and his right hand is affected. Okay, wait, my, but why my dad had some pressure build up his left brain and the right hand is infected, affected. Brickline, you mean like, like cortical pressure? And that affecting the right brain? That I'm not sure about. That is a neuroscience question. There, it's, so my sister, her specialty is gonna be neuroscience and I have bugged her about some of these questions and she was saying with the human studies that they've been looking at, if you have build up on cranial pressure on one side of the brain, that doesn't equate to build up on one side of the brain. That might be a visible build up on one side, but the actual pressure will build up and push force all over the entirety of the brain and it will affect electrical signaling everywhere. It might be a little bit more on one side, but it's also gonna spread and radiate out further. So it's apparently now that's also a misnomer. It's not just localized to one region. It's like it can affect signaling throughout the brain. Again, her specialty is going to be looking at 
um, like neurological disorders like seizures and she just wants to go into the pediatric side of things but um that's one component of it water imbalance on his head according to the docs drilled into the skull to drain the excess fluid brick lane so water build up in the brain can affect not just one side that also affects the uh, molecular balance of neurons so what synaptic vesicles are released and fused with downstream neurons meaning how neurons talk to each other is built on a chemical gradient and if you have too much liquid of a different uh, composition of like you know el electrolytic composition let's say it's like when you're dehydrated um, and the water removes from one cell type to another cell type that could affect the neural signaling and therefore affect different like parts of your body as well and that could be you know exposed regions that it's on there um, it could be a bunch of different areas it but there are neural left right crossovers in the reception system in the motor in the motor system there are some crossover things as well cliff um, but it seems like based on the current data that isn't the only thing at play so it used to be cliff like you know the left side controls the right arm and, and vice versa but there is localized regions on the right side that also influence the right side of movement um so essentially cliff as they're mapping more and more neurons it seems like it the connect the connectomics is just insane that the, you have more of a web versus like a one-to-one -one, you know left to right connection and that's i think that's really complicating it and so even if you look look up the primary literature cliff it's no longer as as straightforward as it was 20 years ago or 50, 10 years ago even where it was like oh it's it's pretty straightforward of how it connects and now it's just not as much on that front uh yes and please ask any and all questions brick if i don't know the answer or if i'm hypothesizing i'll tell you either way um this one ha have been talking with my little sister about because she's again been looking at patients and like like the full-fledged like md front of it so it's that information i trust a little bit more than my own because i you know i do neuroscience on insects it's different obviously from mammalian systems but it's just a neat feature to think about you know, too they can also recognize 12 distinct tones of music and recreate melodies and yes there is an elephant band but perhaps the most amazing thing about elephants is a capacity even more important than cleverness their sense of empathy, altruism, and justice. Elephants are the only non-human animals to mourn their dead, performing burial rituals and returning to visit graves. In fact, there has been evidence to show they bury the tusks. Uh, it's a uh, cliff, cliff, books are not sufficient anymore. Cliff, what's crazy is that there's more and more um, like every like all the, the new publications coming out that further um make it even harder to understand like every night. elephants and we've been talking about their brains the neuroscience behind their behaviors um their odorant capability of smelling things it's absolutely awesome we say you can show off some of the merch i will show off your merch segment chat this is looking to rise what is normal and what is mutated because we uh we go down that rabbit hole but this is what we were just looking at we were talking about the brain and andrew mentioned um thank no thank you my friend thank you zedman i love your face guys zedman not only has that vip badge but he's also got a first badge here he's been around for that long it's wild it's wild we've been knowing like what let me even see this Zedman. we've been hanging out with each other since the july 26 2021 it's lovely i Zedman, we're going to meet very soon, and it's going to be the biggest hug, and then we're going to do this. My best horrendo. Exactly. Going back to the last video, elef calling elephants altruistic drives me crazy. Any kind of mention of altruism drives me crazy, Smikes, because from a biological context, altruism would happen if there is nothing beneficial to either party, but I have seen and heard... Um, neuroscientists argue that a good if you get a good feeling for doing something for someone else 
that inherently makes it not altruistic. The only way that you can actually, like, and I don't, this is like a dark way of looking at the world, but from the molecular component, you if you get an endor endorphin release from doing something nice for someone, that is suggested to be a benefit to you and therefore is no longer altruistic. Now, again, it's, I don't like it, but if we're looking at it from a strict molecular definition, that's how that would work. I do I do want to believe that there is kindness and altruism in the world because it makes it easier to go through the, your day. But again, if we're just looking at the molecules and, we're, and I remove my human emotion from it, then maybe that there aren't any of it. Aren't elephants scared of bees? So Chroma, I think, so elephants do have an, a fear response. And so it's not an innate fear of bees. They have an innate fear of small animal movement. Um, that's where the myth comes that they are afraid of mice. They aren't afraid of mice. They're afraid of the small movement of the animals. They don't see as well. And they, it's, it has the same similar movement as snakes, which we know we and horses have inherent fears of. So it's very similar to the elephant. If the elephant messes with a bunch of bees, and they learn about the stinging, then eventually they'll stay away and learn about and have a fear of bees as well. But that is not an innate behavior. That is a learned behavior um, from the elephant uh, herd, I suppose. I bet that's what they have. So we were just talking again about their learning and memory. And here are the comparative brains. That's the elephant brain, the human brain, and then the dolphin brain marked in red is uh, their hippocampus or their learning and memory center of their brain. The hide, maybe little ones, Mike's young elephants have thicker or thinner hides. And then also insects tend to go for the eyes and the nose. The nose, the trunk that they have, that bottom part of the trunk where they actually lift stuff is very sensitive. There is a ton of sensory neurons in there. That's how they're able to very delicately pick up things and do things like wipe their eye. So if you they get stung or hurt on that region, that could be very painful for them. That is the same as the, a horse's mouth, where they mouth and uh, eat eat random little things. That a lot of sensory neurons in there, and that's how they communicate and like talk to one another as well as through those mouthing engagements. For horses, for elephants, it's through also like their trunks. And so that because of all those sensory regions there, it's possible that if the bees sting there, that could be something. But I agree, like most of their bodies. It would probably be Gucci on that front. Love your face, Mice. Love your face. All right, let's finish up our round of um, their brains. Let oh, us know. That's not the video. Hold on. Did we already finish the brain video? No, he didn't. Here we go. Here's the brain. They have shown concern for other species as well. One working elephant refused to set a log down into a hole where a dog was sleeping while elephants encountering injured humans have sometimes stood guard and gently comforted them with their trunk. On the other hand, elephant attacks on human villages have usually occurred right after massive poachings or cullings. Which those elephants are my heroes. There have been uh, reports showing that when a member of the elephant herd has been killed by a poacher, those elephants will run rampant in that village and destroy it. I'm like, you know what? I'm right on board with you elephants right there. Good job, elephants. Suggesting deliberate revenge. When we consider all this evidence, along with the fact that elephants are one of the few species who can recognize themselves in a mirror, it's hard to escape the conclusion that they are conscious, intelligent, and emotional beings. Unfortunately, humanity's treatment of elephants does not reflect this, as they continue to suffer from habitat destruction in Asia ivory poaching in Africa, and mistreatment in captivity worldwide. Given what we now know about elephants and what they continue to teach us about animal intelligence, it is more important than ever to ensure that what the English poet John Donne described as nature's great masterpiece does not vanish from the world's canvas. Pretty remarkable, right? Um, and again, 
that memory component and that complexity comes down to the hippocampus. That is not a wild theory. In fact, this learning and memory equivalent center in the insect brain, it's called the mushroom body, and it's been said that the larger that region of the brain is, the more social the insects also are. And so it doesn't, it makes sense that if it's larger proportionately to the rest of their brain mass, it would also translate to more advanced mammalian social systems. Um, it doesn't always hold, much like the brain size influencing behavior, but it is something that has been hypothesized a lot. And so it's kind of cool to see that working across different organisms. So for both fruit flies, it holds up, like fruit flies to ants, right? They go up in social complexity from fly to ants and their mushroom bodies or learning and memory centers are much more pronounced and bigger. And the same thing in elephants. These are huge learning and memory centers and they have culture, they have um, extreme memory, they have uh, complex social systems and far more. In fact, the next place I wanted to jump is how the family and social structure of the elephants work. And this again connects back into that learning and memory center of their brains. Um, actually, so it might be a long one to do. So we're gonna continue on, like termites, in my opinion, how smart they are. They are, in Chroma, what's interesting about termites is that they independently evolve social systems of eusocial nature, like um, having a, div a division of labor from like they independently evolved it in the, like there's termites and there's ants and bees and those are the two times in insect evolution where that's happened they were working justice system in place like humans you should not simply retaliate like the elephants did yes but cliff if we had a working justice system the the humans would not be killing an endangered animal that's illegal to kill right cliff i would argue that's a checkmate cliff they the humans are being naughty. If the humans behave, the elephants would behave too. But I, you know, Cliff, I can just, I, I can justify it. That's an eye for an eye right there, and I'm on the elephant side. Don't you hurt the elephants? No elephants must be must be hurt. All right, chat. We're running a little bit low on time, so I will leave it up to y'all. What would you like to do? We can dive a little bit into the evolution of. Um, you didn't put him in check for it. That's fair. That's very fair. No one could. You know how Smikes? There's that movie Dirty Dancing, about how no one could put um, that girl in a corner. I forget her name, but it says no one. It says no one puts so and so in a corner. No one puts Cliff in check. Similar approach. Baby, thank you, Grimley. You can't put Baby in a corner. And you can't put Cliff in check. It's actually an unwritten rule of the universe. Yeah, it's quite wild actually, chat. Um, so, you got two options. One is, if y'all are still with me, we can talk briefly about the evolution of, uh, I know, hi, KK. KK, I, I don't know what to tell you, KK. How you doing, KK? Um, she carried a watermelon. Sometimes she did, Cliff. Sometimes. Sometimes she did. Um, we can talk a little bit about their evolution. I, th I don't think we have time for their social structures because um, those are that is pretty intense. And I also had a cool piece of biology on their um, their taste receptors. But given that we're running a little bit short on that front, we might just I don't know. What are y'all feeling? Do you want to talk a little bit about their evolution? Or are we are we want to call it a night tonight? Uh, eating the wood part might be very annoying. It can't, but Chroma actually eating the wood, I would argue, is very amazing because they're able to digest the brains right now. In comparison of different elephant, a brain elephant of a brain. Andrew, thank you, Lord Gators. Brains of elephants compared to brains of other animals and how that corresponds to intellect and culture. Uh, we're rounding out our discussion tonight, Smorf, on the evolution of these animals. And so here's an, the original elephant of the mastodons. And we're going to just take a quick rabbit hole and just to talk about how these evolved. Uh, oh, and sorry, this is called the platybelodon. 
this elephant right here. A little bit of the evolution of these creatures. Tiv had the entire gar- Volcano Doc! My god, my voice just squeaked. I apologize. Welcome in, Volcano Doc. Then we re recently had a beautiful pterosaur baby discovered in Germany posted in Discord, I think. Cliff, there was another one today discovered of two dinosaurs copulating and frozen in time. Which is quite amazing. Volcano Doc, we've been talking about elephants tonight. Their biology, the neuroscience of them, um, some of their... Uh, the brain structures, the social structures, um, and some of their genetics as well. Guys, if you like science also, if you like volcanology, please check out the lovely and amazing, the breathtaking Volcano Doc. DOI, you're very right, Volcano Doc. You're very right. They have mastodons you can touch at the La Brea Terra Pits. Oh, very cool, okay, okay. I have not been there before. Not been, I've been to LA, but I've not been to those pits. I was there for a conference and all I could do was conferencing on there. Um, I'll have to check it out next time. Garden shed on its face. A lower jaw that looked like a shovel, but functioned like a scythe. While it may look like a cartoon character, this animal has given us some serious intel into its family tree, and even the major geological events of its time. This is Platybelodon. Just thought it would be a fun way to wrap up the evening, a little bit about the evolution of these animals. Hi, I'm Talia Lowy Mary, and you're watching Paleologic. Today, we're talking about a scoop-faced, elephant-like animal lovingly nicknamed the Shovel Tusker. Platybelodon was a genus of likely five species of extinct animals that lived across Europe, Asia, and Africa. Platybelodon, which loosely means flat-tusked, was a member of the order Proboscidea. The only surviving family of Proboscidea is Elephantidae, which encompasses our modern elephants. Proboscideans were, and still are, the largest land mammals ever known. Hi, Gigalinks, welcome in. Giga, we're talking about elephant biology tonight. We talked a lot about their neuroscience earlier, why they can smell so many mo more odors than other animals, it's actually a density question of their neurons in the olfactory center of their brain. And also, they have expansions, a genetic expansion of the olfactory receptor genes. They have more and more copies, and they get mutated so they can detect more odors. Their social system, we talked about their fear of mice, and much more. If that sounds appealing to anyone, make sure to also subscribe to the YouTube page, where we'll be having some of these stories posted. The biggest of the big that we know of was Paleoloxodon nematicus, or the Asian straight-tusked elephant, which stood over 5 meters at the shoulder and probably weighed 22 tons. Other extinct proboscidean families include mastodons and stegodons, which lived until as recently as 4,000 years ago. Some species of stegodons evolved to be teeny tiny, at least in elephant terms, of course. Standing at a miniature 1.2 meters tall and weighing just a couple hundred kilos. Platybelodon are part of the now extinct Amabelodontidae family, though until very recently they were thought to belong to the Gomphotheridae family. Gomphotheres were widespread across all continents, except Australia and Antarctica, and first appeared somewhere around 25 million years ago and died out just about 8,000 years ago in the early Holocene. Depending on their diets, gomphotheres had highly specialized teeth, and most had two sets of tusks, one on the top and one on the bottom. These tusks were actually modified second incisors. The first set grew downwards like an elephant's, and the second grew upwards out of the lower jaw. They also had trunks or proboscises, some of which were elephant-sized, others which were shorter like the snout of a tapir. The spoon-jawed platybelodon lived during the Miocene. They were slightly smaller than modern-day elephants, at about three meters long, and they likely weighed about two to three tons. Uh, Smorv says also, plot twist, I sort of know what I'm doing Saturday. Quick announcement for y'all, Smorvosaurus is having a uh, 500 follower celebration on Saturday, so make sure to check out some more for that. Thank you for the reminder, Smorphosaurus. 
Since its fossils were most often found near what would have been bodies of water, it was originally assumed that Platybelodon used its flat lower tusks in combination with its trunk to scoop up water plants. More recently, however, one study looked at the characteristic curved wear pattern on the lower tusks to try and understand Platybelodon's diet. The best current hypothesis is that these tusks, which are consistently sharpened, were used to slice vegetation. This theory would therefore turn their tusks from shovels into scythes. For decades, most images of Platybelodon show it with a wide and flap-like trunk, thanks to Margaret Flinch and Henry Fairfield Osborne's restorations from the 1930s. That flappy structure of the trunk has been challenged in recent studies, since it doesn't seem to be based on sound morphological evidence. Instead, it was more likely that Platybelodon had a functional trunk, much like modern elephants, which it would use to grasp vegetation to drag across its lower tusks to cut up and eat. Unlike some extinct animals which are shrouded in mystery due to lack of fossil evidence, we actually have a pretty good picture of Platybelodon's frame and growth, thanks to a wealth of fossilized skeletons that have been found. One quarry in Mongolia revealed almost 10 complete specimens, most of which were very young platybelodons that likely got stuck in a bog-like area and died. An adult specimen from the site even had an unborn fetus skeleton between its pelvic bones, so we can see how platybelodon developed from the womb to adulthood. Which the remarkable thing about this is we can do then comparative anatomy between modern elephants and these ancient elephants as well, or elephant relatives, and see you know, what differences there are. And it's a great catch to find one, like, in development as well. So you can, you know, you might not be able to estimate how far along in development it is based because we don't know their exact developmental history, but you can compare it over to modern-day elephants and kind of infer of what the timeline would be. I know, right, Volcano? Can you imagine if we found that for a dinosaur? Or, I guess, really any extinct creature, that's a huge find. It would have been cool to find it in the, like frozen woolly mammoths a sample like that, I think. The abundance of platybelodon specimens that have been found have given us clues about more than just their eating habits. From these fossils, we know that platybelodon males and females had different tusks. In dreams, one is not Sleep well, by gaming. limitations. What does that mean? Come. Sleep well, Big Gaming. Hello, Epic of Sam. Welcome in, Epic of Sam. How you doing, Epic of Sam? Sleep well, Masterly. Big game, you sleep very well. Have a great day tomorrow, big game. Chat with you later. How you doing, Epica Sam? Welcome in. Talking about elephants tonight. Structures. This tusk difference, which is seen in a variety of species, is an example of sexual dimorphism, and usually occurs because males use their tusks for combat to win a mate. In Platybelodon, males sport large upper tusks, which are smaller in the females. These tusks don't show any signs of wear, which means that they likely weren't used in combat or feeding. The fact that their lower tusks are the same in males and females further reinforces the hypothesis that their lower tusks were used for feeding and therefore necessary for all platybelodons, regardless of their sex. So because there wasn't a difference, it seems like males and females on this lower one. Thank you, Epica Sam, for the biddies. Um, then they're being a uh, utilizing they're utilizing then these for feeding behavior versus these tusks were different between uh, males and females of the species, which I think is really cool. By contrast, so it's like you're looking through morpho morphologically studying when these things happen. The North American cousins of the platybelodon, Amabelodon, used their upper as well as their lower tusks for eating. Since both males and females equally used their upper tusks, there is no apparent sexual dimorphism present in the Amabelodon genus. The recent discovery of a new member of the Amabelodontidae family, Ephanobelodon jawai, revealed that this elephant form had no upper tusks at all. With every new species discovery in this order, paleontologists are further expanding our knowledge about the evolutionary history of proboscideans. Sometimes, fossilized animals reveal more than just secrets about themselves, but also the world in which they lived. 
The existence of Platybelodon, for example, actually gives us huge clues about one of the most important geological events of the Cenozoic era, the formation of the Tibetan Plateau. Exactly how and when the Tibetan Plateau uplifted remains a mystery to this day, but the animal fossils recovered from the area give us clues about its timeline. For example, giant rhinos from the Oligocene were found both north and south of the plateau, indicating that it wasn't high enough to prevent the exchange of large animals 33.9 to 23 million years ago. By the time Platybelodon existed in the Middle Miocene, around 16 to 11.6 million years ago, the plateau was too high for animals to cross, since the many troves of Platybelodon fossils are only found north of the plateau. As we discover more fossils of these unique spork jaws, we're sure to learn even more about them and their fascinating world. So that's just a little bit about the evolutionary history that we know about elephants. There's obviously a whole lot more to talk about. Um, I really like the evolutionary history of them and the different flavors they came in. Same thing with rhinos in the past um, and just the different variances they had. But I think that's where we'll leave it for this evening. Um, again, I think the biggest thing that we chatted about tonight, again, is looking at the brain structure of these animals in comparison to humans and dolphins, and then chatting about the ex expansion of the odor and groups, that they have more olfactory receptors, allowing there to be an increased amount of smell ability that these animals have. And I think that's um, a very unique feature of these animals. Gotta head to bed, my friend. I hope everyone's had a big night. You too looking cool. Zed man. Zeddy. Perfect timing, good sir. We're just about to wrap on up as well. Thank you for the raid, ye handsome devil. You Zedman, as y'all know, is one of our what? My best horrendo. Indeed, y'all can hit that command too. Exclamation point BFF will trigger that lovely command right there. So chat. In review tonight, what did we talk about? We talked about how the elephant's olfactory sensing neurons were expanded, meaning there's more copies of them. These further copies had some mutations introduced to them. The mutations that were introduced to them meant that they got, they, it didn't have the original, they did not smell the original thing that that was designed to smell, right? Instead, those uh, receptors and those neurons started smelling more and more things that were not originally intended for it with the introduction of additional mutations. With all those mutations, those continued to add up and they expanded their smell repertoire, meaning they, they can smell more and more things that were originally detected. We also talked about how it was utilized to smell water and how they utilize this in the, their day-to-day -day lives. We then switched to talking about expansion of their brain, in particular the hippocampus, which was their primary learning and memory center. On top of that, we also chatted about um, how they are actually not afraid of mice, but rather they're afraid of the movement. So we dispelled one of those myths, at least tonight. And a little again, a bit again about their evolution. So I think overall quite a nice and multifaceted uh series of uh elephant stuff that we chatted about tonight pretty pretty fun i think pretty fun lots of topics tonight epic 